بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Where is the number of this hadith? Number 17 طيب uh, Do we have to have this background? Uh, they're fixing it? Okay Inshallah before يعني the end of Okay uh, This is in chapter number Eight, uh, Allah curses who curses his parents. Abu Tufail, one of the tabi'een, said that Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, was asked, did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam grant you something special which he did not grant to anyone else? So Ali said, no, he did not specify us with something other than the general public, except to what I have in my sheath. And this is where you put your sword. So it's like something that you put in. So he took out a piece of paper and in it was written, May Allah Azza wa Jal curse those who slaughter to other than Allah. May Allah the Almighty curse those who change the landmarks of the land. May Allah curse those who curse their parents. And may Allah curse whoever gives shelter to a muhdith. And we will come to mention this inshallah. First of all. What do we learn from this hadith? We learn that the Rafidah, widely and commonly known as a Shia, Rafidah is the name, the actual Islamic name. Oh, mashallah, that is Rafidah in the sound system. Rafidah are the Shia who go to extreme in their claimed love of Alul Bayt. And this is a total fabrication and a lie. They do not love Alul Bayt. They are a big chunk of hypocrites trying to undermine Islam and the Sunnah of the Prophet. It, their religion is based on total lies. And we can have a long discussion from their books. Proving that. But this is not the time. So, why do we say that this hadith exemplifies, illustrates that they are liars? Because they say that Ali, Hassan Hussein, and those descendants of them have knowledge of Islam that no one shares with them. And this is why this hadith is very important to us. Because we believe that Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, it is seated number four in the best of the companions. So Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, this is their ranking in Islam. Ali is their fourth, without any doubt. So he was asked, do you have anything specific? Sh should I pause or do something? Okay. So he was asked, do you have anything specific that calls you to be more distinct than others? He said, nothing. Everything you have, I have, except this that I have registered in my paper. So one would think that it's a registration of a land, piece of land only for him, or special powers or that he's the successor after the Prophet, and something special. And when he brought the paper, there are four things in them. And they're all cursed. So they are about sins. Now, what's the ruling on cursing? Do you have cursing in, uh, in Malay? What do you say?
Okay, let me rephrase. Let me rephrase. In Arabic, the translation curse is not accurate. Because curse can be mentioning insults and things from the belt below. In English, curse. So when you say something that is vulgar, something that is disrespectful, mentioning your father, your mother, insulting them, this is called what? Curse. In Arabic, this is not what is intended. The Arabic word is la'n. And la'na. Yal'an. All of these are derived from the same. So what does it mean? The chapter we are dealing with is Allah curses, meaning Allah in Arabic. The definition of la'n. In, in the Quran, Allah says, La'natullah ala dhalimeen. The curse of Allah is among the transgressors, the wrongdoers. What does la'an mean? Definition of la'an in Arabic is to get someone out of the mercy of Allah. End of story. Why do I say do you have curse in Malay? Not to slander someone's mother or daughter or his honor. No, this is not what I intend. In Arabic, when I say la'an, I say Allah yil'anak. Me Allah get you out of his mercy. The word yil'anak. La'nat Allah alayk. The curse of Allah is upon you. So I am referring to this type of curse. Do you have it in Malay? You don't have anything related to Allah. You have anything, which is good, sort of. See, when someone says, I'm going to curse Sheikh Asim. Sheikh Asim, you're stupid. You are a moron. He's cursing me, right? In Arabic, this is not cursing me. He's insulting me. In Arabic, if he says, Allah heal anak. This is the Islamic word of curse, of la'n. So this is what we, or I'm going to relate to when I speak about curse. So now, please refocus. When I say curse, I mean to get someone out of the mercy of Allah. This is what I am uh, uh, referring to when I speak about curse. First of all, is it permissible to curse someone specifically? The answer is no. Why? Because if you say to someone, may Allah get you out of his mercy, if he's out of his mercy, where is he? In hell. Alas. So this is totally not permissible. However, there is a difference between individual cursing and general cursing. What is the difference? If I have brother Abdullah here, and I say, Abdullah, may Allah curse you. This is individual cursing. This is haram. General cursing is similar to what the Prophet had said, alayhi salatu wasalam. First, those who associate others with Allah. Second, those who uh, associate by slaughtering. Those who uh, change the landmark. The landmark, and we will come to talk about this. So, in the Quran, Allah mentions a lot of the times that may Allah curse the wrongdoers. May Allah curse the transgressors. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, in so many hadith, may Allah curse, meaning to take out of Allah's mercy. Huh? So many categories of people. One, the one who steals. Two, the one who fornicates. For women, for example, the Prophet cursed the women who pluck their eyebrows. A lot of the women do this, don't they? In Saudi Arabia, I don't know, I'm not talking about Malay, I'm talking about Saudi Arabia. They have it like crazy. They go and pluck their hair, their eyebrows, either plucking or cutting with the scissors or shaving and then drawing again. Seriously, this is crazy. Women just want to be beautiful. Is it wrong? No. But do it in the halal way. So Allah cursed, the Prophet cursed those who do this. The Prophet also cursed those who connect their hair with extensions. In Malay, they don't have any problem with that because their hair is, yeah, mashallah, naturally good. 
In Arabia, we have like hair like this, afros, and it's woo, very, very strange. So they have to, you know, put chemicals on it, soften it, uh, then put extensions and make it big. And all of this is haram. They're cursed. So now in Arabia, if I see a woman coming with plucked eyebrows, I said, may Allah curse you. Is this permissible? Some say yes, some say no. It's an issue of dispute. Everything you people ask about, say, it's an issue of dispute. Is this halal or haram? Issue of dispute. So those who say it is halal to curse this woman who has eyebrows uh, plucked, raise your hands. One, two, three, four. Oh, now they're increasing. Mashallah. Five, six, seven. Okay, maybe five percent. Those who say it's haram, raise your hands. Mashallah, then again, 15 percent. 80 percent undecided. <laughs> or asleep. Or hungry. And there is a fourth possibility. They own beauty parlors. That's why they don't want to. See, again we come back to the beginning. Individually, you are not allowed to curse. La'an, you're not allowed to. Generally speaking, yes. So this woman who plucks or extends her hair with extensions, there are many possibilities that she can be exempted from such a curse. No ignorance, being forced, being this, being that. At the end of the day, it's not for you and me. The curse is in Allah's hand. So don't hold yourself a judge. Uh, this portion will go to hell. This portion will go to heaven. Good for you. No, this is not for you and me. Always be on top. Once you become judgmental and, Sheikh, you will go to hell, inshallah then you are in hell. Seriously, those who condemn people to being in hell, they will be in hell. So this is not permissible. Likewise, see, judging people is very easy. There are so many people who, and we hear this in the media, when they come and talk about jihad, they say so-and-so was martyred in the cause of Allah. Is this permissible? Does he pluck his eyebrows? <laughs> it's not related. Come on, think, think positive. This is not related. A guy died in the battlefield. We say he is a martyr in the cause of Allah. Correct? Nope. When you say he's a martyr, you say he's in Jannah. You are praising an individual. I don't know what is in his heart. I say whoever dies on the battlefield or the cause of Allah will enter Jannah. This Abdullah individual, I cannot judge him. If I say he's a shaheed, he's a martyr, I am giving him the permission to enter Jannah and this I do not hold in my hands. So it is very important to know the concept of judging people and to uh, say what is right and what is wrong. We go to... Okay, Allah curses whoever sacrifices an animal to other than Allah. Why? Hmm? Shirk. It's very easy. Any form of worship you devote to other than Allah is considered shirk. Any questions? So if I pray to, I have a, a sister. Ya Allah, I hope this, I hope she sees this. I hope. Is this uh, live or? It was, okay. She had sent me literally in the past month more than a hundred emails. Every email she says, Sheikh, is it dutiful to my husband that I am worshiping him? She's obsessed by obeying her husband is shirk. And I keep saying no. Uh, you, okay, if you're dutiful to your parents, are you worshipping them? She keeps on re rotating and coming back to the same. There are Muslims who are obsessed. When I say obsessed, I mean they're sick. Wallahi, I feel sorry. I have so many questions on OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. People doubting their wudu. Sheikh, if I 
come out of the toilet and I touch the knob of the door. And before me was a person, and I don't know if he washed his hands or not. So is my hand considered to be najis, nabak, as they say in Urdu? And if I touch the TV and the kitchen and the couch, should I wash all of this? What kind of questions do I get? Wallah, I get hundreds of questions like this. And I have to answer them. This sister, I tell her, you are psych. You need psychiatric help. After maybe 20 emails being soft, I went into attack mode. I said, you're sick and you're wasting my time. Because some these OCD people, if you keep on talking to them, they take, wallahi, the whole day from you. You have to come to a stand and slap them. To wait, seriously. Otherwise, it will destroy their lives. First, it starts with purity. Then it starts with the food. Then it starts with their self-hygiene. Then it starts with, am I married or not? He comes to me, Sheikh, I divorced my wife. I said, okay, she's divorced. Said, no, no, I didn't say it. It's in my mind. So she's not divorced. Yes, but I keep on telling myself, did I say it or not? And he, he keeps on coming. I said, Akhi, you're, she's not divorced. Because even if you say it, you are insane. And the insane's divorce is not valid. Seriously. So now, any form of worship attributed to other than Allah is what? Do you have any doubts in that? A lot of the brothers in, Malay, in Malaysia, when they come and shake hands, they say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. What are you doing? This is rukur, and bowing cannot be except to Allah. Be careful. Oh, Sheikh, this is a custom. Custom. Immigration, <laughs> tax offices, this is your problem. In my religion, this is what? Bowing. Even if you play karate or judo, if you're Japanese, it is not permissible. Nodding, some scholars say it's haram. Others say it's okay, nodding. So when someone says, hi, hi, Ibn al-Qayyim says it's haram. Ibn al-Qayyim says, this is haram because imitating the kuffar. This, this, this is his time. Nowadays, we do this, we do this, we do, I don't know, they have so many symbols. This is haram. So bowing, be careful. You're my people, I love you guys. It's against Islam to bow. Straight, keep your head and bow. Kissing the hands of your parents is a permissible. No problem with that. It includes bowing. If you're not going to break your mother's shoulder and <laughs> lift your, I just want to. No, you have to do this, but it's not included in the bowing process because it's kneeling for the kissing of the hand is permissible. So I just thought that to bring this to your attention. So number two, changing the ma landmark. Changing the landmark. How would you change the landmark? Here now, it's pr probably difficult in Arabia. In the ruler areas, this happens overnight. I have a hundred square meters. I go to bed. I wake up in the morning. It's 90. What? what happened? My neighbor came at the night, moved the fence a little bit. His land is bigger. Mine is smaller. In Arabia, a lot of killing results from this. You wake up, you find your property is short. You are in dispute. You can't prove it. You go to the judge. The judge says, bring me your evidence. You don't have evidence. You end up killing him. His son ends up killing you. Your son ends up killing his brother. And the feud goes on and on. This is why Allah takes out of his mercy those who change the landmarks. This can cascade into so many things because you are cheating, you are altering the truth, and this is not our topic. Thirdly, Allah Azza wa Jal curses those who curse their parents. Now, there are two types of cursing your parents, direct and indirect. The direct is to go to your father and say, may Allah curse you. Your mother, may Allah curse you. And this happens. 
if the man in his mid-50s slapped his mother on the face, it would be easier to curse. And this would not be imagined except from the very evilest person possible. To be this abusive to the parent, this is beyond imagination. Yet the indirect cursing is happening every single day. How is that? In Arabia, alhamdulillah, you don't have this in your culture. In Arabia, we have it like rice. And this is when I curse your father. If I'm at dispute with you, I say, Allah hil'an abuk. May Allah curse your father. Allah hil'an ummak. Now, I feel strange saying this because I never say this in Arabic. Not even in my thoughts. So I'm saying it happily because people don't know Arabic. Allah hil'an abuk. So it brings joy to me. To, I'm, I'm doing something I'm unable to do. I like coming to Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> Anyhow, this happens a lot, especially in fights when people are fighting and driving. You hear this all the time in schools. Unfortunately, it happens even with the youngsters, jokingly. So when they, two youngsters in the university or at high school meet, one another, and they haven't seen each other for a long time. What have you been? May Allah curse your father. May Allah curse your mother. And he's joking, happy. And he said, May Allah curse your father as well. The other one replies, This is indirect. The Prophet said, It is a major sin to curse one's father, one's own father. And the companion says, Oh, Prophet of Allah, who would curse his own father? Who would curse his own mother? He said, ah, you curse another, another man's father, and he curses your father in return. So this is indirect. The Prophet says, do not bring this to your father by cursing others' fathers. And it's like touche. You curse my mother, I curse your mother. You accuse me in my honor, I accuse you in your honor. If your house is made of glass, what? Don't throw people's houses with stones. Because once they do, your house will be taken down. And the final, very important, is may Allah curse whoever gives shelter to a muhdith. Muhdith has a number of uh, interpretations. One of them is an innovator. Someone who makes innovation. Bid'a. You know Bid'a. We Wahhabi is all Bid'a, Bid'a, Bid'a. We have nothing called Wahhabi. No one in Saudi Arabia is called I'm a Wahhabi. They will laugh at you. Yet people are trying to tarnish the reputation of the Salafi da'wah of the Wahhabi, of Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, so that they can pe keep people away. It is called Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah, or called Salafiyya. Nothing as Wahhabis. But when we come to innovation, is it part of the deen? Is it? It is totally not related to deen. Chapter 5, Surat Al-Ma'idah, verse number 3. Allah said, and this ayah was revealed on the day of Arafah, on the 10th year of Hijrah. Today I have completed your religion. And perfected my favor upon you. And accepted Islam to be your religion. If it is part of the religion that was completed on the 10th year of Hijrah, then it's good, do it. If it is something not part of the deen, then it is what? Bid'ah, an innovation. Simple as that. And you cascade this on everything we have in life to know whether you're following the sunnah or you're having a new innovation. Anything. So this watch, it's a tag ur. Is it an innovation or not? Was it at the time of the Prophet? So, 
It's not innovation? It is. Those who say, it is not, raise your hands. Okay. It is not an innovation. Okay, alhamdulillah. Those who say, it is an innovation, raise your hands. MashaAllah, none of them has a watch shop. Akhi, an innovation is related to religion. If this was an innovation, how come a Salafi Sheikh is wearing it? <laughs> what are you talking about? This is 11,000 ringgits. It's a gift, by the way, it's not mine. It, someone gave it to me. I never buy such stuff. So, an innovation is related to religion. Your car is not an innovation because it's not related to religion. But if someone comes to me every Friday and sends me a WhatsApp, Jum'ah Mubarakah. Hmm, Jum'ah related to Friday and it's a greeting. Let's go back to year 10 Hijrah at the time of the Prophet and the companions. Was it ever reported that they used to congratulate each other on Jum'ah? No. Did they have the reason to do so? Yes. Jum'ah was every week. It's a blessed day. And it would only be normal that they exchange greetings if it were part of the religion. Have they ever done this? Nope. So, classification? Bid'ah. Now, is it a serious and big bid'ah as slaughtering to other than Allah? No, of course not. But who cares how big or small it is? Our religion is based on following the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. You follow him, you go to Jannah. You divert a little bit and say, yeah, but he didn't do it, but um, maybe he did it and it was not reported to us. Some people say this. He did it, but it was not reported to us. If it was not reported to us, then it is not part of the deen. Because Allah said, today I have completed your religion. Part of being complete that it all came to us. Otherwise, the sky is the limit. I can say uh, the Prophet did this particular sin, but it was not related to us. The Prophet used to beat his wife every single day, but it did, was not related to us. This is nonsense. Religion is crystal clear. The Prophet said, I have left you on a clear sheet. The day and the night is separated. It's so clear that no one can have any ambiguity in it. This is the beauty of a religion. You don't need a, a cleric, a sheikh, a priest to explain religion to you. It's in black and white, Quran and Sunnah. Where I'm getting this information from? From my pocket? I'm making it up? It's all referenced. But you need to do some research. And if you do some research, then there's no need for me to lecture you. This is a big problem for me. So this is why you stay ignorant and I will teach you. <laughs> no problem in that. Seriously, Islam is a beautiful religion. You don't need clerics, interpreters to interpret you. It's in black and white. 95% of it, any layman can understand. 5%, you need fine tuning from people who are more knowledgeable in you, or, 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 or more knowledgeable than you to explain and to bring the rationale behind it. So, when we come to innovation, it's a serious thing. Whenever you innovate in Islam, you are actually devastating and destroying a sunnah. Each innovation destroys a particular sunnah. The more the innovations, the less the sunnah is, and it's a different religion altogether. So, we move on. The following hadith, hadith number 18, I think, Okay, it's, mashallah, a long hadith. I don't know if I can manage this, but I will try. Abu Darda, one of the companions of the Prophet والسلام, from Al-Ansar, from Medina. He said that the Prophet والسلام, advised me with nine things. Now, it's in bullet points. So I hope yani I managed to read it because translating it would be a little bit difficult. One, do not associate anything with Allah even if you are cut to pieces or burnt. Two, 
Do not abandon an obligatory prayer deliberately. Anyone who deliberately abandons it will lose Allah's protection. Three, do not drink wine or intoxicants in general, for it is the key to every evil. Four, obey your parents. If they command you to abandon your uh, worldly possessions, then leave it for their sake. This is what we are interested in from all the nine. Uh, do not contend with those in power, even if you think you are more capable. Do not run away from the army when it, is, uh, when it advances, even if you are killed and your companions run away. Spend on your family out of your means. Do not raise a stick against your family. Command your family to fear Allah, the mighty and exalted. And it ends by saying sound. Now, this is the only hadith in the course that I beg to differ. To me, the hadith is not authentic. Now, how can we relate to the authenticity of a hadith? The science of hadith is a very high-level science. It's not for Tom, Dick, and Harry to comment on. When there is a hadith, only a scholar of hadith can comment on it. So, Sheikh Asam, are you a scholar of hadith? The answer is no. I wouldn't be with you here if I was a scholar of hadith. I would be in my ivory tower doing my research and giving fatwas. A scholar of hadith is a person who had spent so many, many years, like Imam Bukhari, in researching, memorizing, analyzing the hadiths. And the hadith is composed of two main aspects. One is the isnad, which is the chain of narrators. How did we get this hadith? Well, I found it on 9-11 or 7-11 or whatever shop. No, there's nothing like this. I found it on a paper. No, there has to be a chain of narrators. So Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the great Imam of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or Imam Malik ibn Anas, the compiler of Al-Muwatta, or Baqi ibn Makhlad, or so old scholars, come and say, this man whom I met told me that this man, that this man, that Abu Huraira heard the Prophet say, alayhi So this is known as what? Sanad. Sanad. This is the chain of narrators. It's a science to study each individual. So man number one, what is his biography? The scholars who were contemporary tell us that he used to sell cloth. He was married to three women. One of them killed him. He was this and that. He was a truthful person. So everything I know about his credibility, what the scholars said about him, they say he was A+. plus. Okay, second man. Yes, one of his teachers was so-and-so. One of his students was so-and-so. And we go through this. Now, it's a long process. It has so many books, volumes, science behind it. The second aspect of the hadith is al-matin. Al-matin is the actual words of the Prophet ﷺ. So al-matin is إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Deeds are uh, uh, um, considered by their intention. This is al-matin. It has to fall in line with the other hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, before that, with the Qur'an. So if it goes against the Qur'an or the Sunnah, it is not accepted. But who has the ability to reject it? Only the scholars of hadith who know the totality of the hadith. Not for you sitting there on your couch saying, I don't like this hadith. Why don't you like this hadith? It doesn't sound good. No. So, okay, Sheikh Asim, coming back to the question. Who are you to judge this hadith not to be authentic? It's not me. There are a list of scholars who considered it to be 
not authentic. And I will come to explain some of the aspects that where you can see that this is uh, not authentic for. First of all, point number one, do not associate anything with Allah even if you are cut to pieces or burnt. Does this go in line with the general concept of Islam? Yes. Do I hear no? All yes? Raise your hands if yes. Yeah, you, these people are negative. Where do you get them from? Get someone active, being hyper. And, um, yes, goes in line with the concepts of Islam. Yes. Okay, no. Okay, no are very shy, but there are many. And the, actually, it is no. This does not go in line with the concept, general concept of Islam. You remember the hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir. He came to the Prophet ﷺ weeping in Mecca time. And he, the Prophet said, what's wrong? He said, oh Prophet Allah, the idol worshippers took me and beat the hell out of me. Tortured me, did awful things to me. Until I agreed to say bad things about you. And when I said bad things about you, they stopped. So he is remorseful. He is sad. So the Prophet said, how do you find your heart when you said bad things about me? How was your heart? Oh, Prophet of Allah, it was in the highest state of Iman. But I couldn't. I was punished like crazy. I did kufr. Slandering the Prophet is what? It's kufr. So the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, if they go back to torturing you, go back into insulting me. And Allah revealed the ayah. Whoever disbelieves in Allah after his belief, accept. For the one who is forced to renounce his religion while his heart in his chest, uh, uh, while his heart is chest to disbelief, upon them is the wrath from Allah. So Allah says that those who disbelieve willingly, upon them is the wrath of Allah, except those who are forced to renounce it, but their heart is filled with tranquility and with belief. So does this go against this one? It does. So if someone is under gunpoint and they tell you either you prostrate to Buddha or to this cow or to idols or we will kill you. And you say, no, I would rather die. And they kill you. This is not what Islam tells you. Islam tells you Preserve your life, live another 20 years of productivity, do good things for Islam, and prostrate because your heart is filled with Iman. So this is point number, do you understand me? Okay, alhamdulillah. Ya Rabbi, like alham, people are awake still. Okay, abandoning obligatory prayer, we know that this is the major sin. And the most authentic, it's an issue of dispute. The most authentic opinion is whoever does not pray at all, not a single prayer in the whole year, is a kafir. If you're married to one, leave them. Because he's not a Muslim or she is not a Muslim. If he prays on and off, prays two times a day, one time a, a, a day, then he's a Muslim, but he is very sinful. Try to advise him, keep on trying your level best to call him back to Islam. And there is on YouTube a beautiful, because I did it, a beautiful uh, uh, debate between Abu Amina, Bilal Phillips, and myself. We did it about four years ago in Birmingham in the UK, before I was banned from entering UK. This means I'm, 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 I'm famous. And I'm happy when they ban, I'm banned, alhamdulillah. So it's, it's beautiful because the Sheikh Abu Amina, Bilal Phillips, displayed the opinion that says he's not a kafir. I displayed the opinion, those who say it's kafir. And you can learn a lot from the evidences presented from both and come up with a conclusion of your own, inshallah. Uh, number whatever, do not drink wine 
for it is the key to every evil. What is the hadith? The hadith is wala tashrabanna al-khamr. This is crystal clear. So anything that intoxicates you, whether it's beer, it's vodka, it's tequila, it's gin, it's bourbon, it's scotch, it's what, whatever, you know. It's all haram. You cannot consume it. Anything that takes your mind, if consumed in large quantities, one drop is haram. Obvious and clear, inshallah. Uh, obey your parents. If they command you to abandon your worldly possessions, then leave it for their sake. This is the essence that you should obey your parents. This is why we brought this hadith here. And this sentence is correct. There is a hadith where the Prophet says to a companion, you and your wealth belong to your father. You know this hadith? Yes? Every father knows this hadith by heart. <laughs> the children, no, is it sahih? Is it authentic? I've heard it, but I'm not sure. It is authentic. Yet the understanding of it Differs. I know a brother whose son is a multimillionaire. And he keeps on asking his son to, take, to give him a trip around the world to buy him a new villa, to buy a new furniture, new TVs, and buy cars. And, and the son comes to me and complains. And the justification of that father is that my son and his wealth, as the Prophet said, belongs to me. His understanding is wrong. Why? Because the consensus of all scholars, if the son dies, who or what does the father inherit? If the understanding is as the father understands it, the father should inherit Everything and nothing goes to the wife, nothing goes to the son, nothing goes to the, uh, the daughter, nothing goes to the mother. But this is not the case. If he has a son, the father gets only one sixth. And his grandson gets the rest. You know the inheritance thing. This is not the time. But the concept is, if you understand the relationship, then you go back to understanding you and your wealth. Wealth belong to your father. What does it mean then? It means that you should not deprive, you should not prevent your father from what he needs. You must give to your father what he needs if you have access. So a multimillionaire like myself. Why are they laughing? Okay. Manish, I forgive you. A multimillionaire like myself. My father comes and says... I want 100,000 uh, uh, ringgits to change the furniture of the house. I said, okay. I look into my father's wealth, and I find that my father has in his bank account 100 million. Excuse me, why do you want to take from me? If I have access and it would not affect me, it is a must for me to give him. Because even if they ask you to come out of your worldly possessions, do it. But there are restrictions. If I am a 9 to 5 worker, an employee, I have my salary. I have my wife, my children, my uh, uh, flat I live in. And I want to improve my life. I don't have my own property. And he wants to take a portion of what I possess that would affect my wife's livelihood. Or my children's livelihood. In this case, I do not give him. Except what he needs. If he's stone broke, I have to provide from him food, shelter. But if he has money and he asks me of something that harms me, I am not entitled to give him. It's not my obligation. I give you another example. I'm rich. I have money. And he has money, but not that rich. And he says, I need 10,000 ringgits. I said, with all pleasure, my father, why do you need it for? He said, I want to give your brother the money so that he could go for vacation. No, 
Now you're not being fair to me. You want to use my money for my sibling? No. For you, I give you whatever you wish. For your livelihood. But when you come and cross the line to take my money for my siblings, Islam tells you you're not your obligation. Of course, if you have a lot of money like me, it's okay. It's best to give it to him. And Allah would quadruple it for you up to 700 times. Allah will return it to you. You did not work hard for the money, did you? Allah gave it to you. There are so many people who work 10 times more than you and cannot get one-tenth of what you have. So the provider is Allah Azza wa So don't hold back. Whenever Allah tells you give, you give and then Allah would substitute you for that. And then, do not contend with those in power. Who are those in power? Hello? Who are those in power? The government, the ruler, they are in power. Do not contend with them. Do not object. Do not oppose. Do not riot. Do not go on protest. Are you crazy? Don't you see what happened in Yemen? Don't you see what happened in Syria? In Libya? In Egypt? In Iraq? Would you like your country to be like this? Don't you appreciate the blessing of Allah that you have? All the food, all the shelter, all the infrastructure, all the peace that you enjoy? Why are you crazy? Yeah, they did this, they did that. And mashallah, when you were in power, what did you do? I don't talk in politics because I'm Saudi. So let's not go into these issues. But think, when you have a life going for you, maintain Allah's blessing and favor. Don't change it. Because Allah will not change it until you change it yourself. Then things will go out of hand. Enjoy the education of your children, the upbringing, the peaceful that we are in, that we are able to conduct this. Learn the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Other countries, they can't. Recently, up till recently, in Tunisia, six years ago, if they found you praying in the same masjid five times, they will take you for questioning. They register those who pray in masjid. I have students of knowledge. They swear to me that whenever four of us want to come, and read a book of Bukhari, we take a trip from one city to the other so that we can do this in the car. If they catch us in one of the people's houses, they abduct us and take us to prison. <laughs> ya akhi, you are in great favor of Allah Azza wa Jal. Do not contend with those in power even if you think you are more capable. Because once you assume the throne, you'll, you'll be more evil you'll be more corrupt. And you will hire only those who are related to you. Your friends, your relatives, your loved ones, and all the businesses will pour into your own pocket. And you will come on TV saying that integrity, honesty is the most important thing. Stay away from what corrupts your heart. Don't contend. And then the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, if the hadith was authentic, do not, do not run away from the army when it advances, even if you are killed and your companions run away. Now this goes against the ayah in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, O you who believe, when you meet those who disbelieve advancing for battle, <coughs> do not turn to them your backs. Yani, do not run away. And whoever turns his back to them on such a day, on the day of war, unless swerving as a strategy for war or joining another company, then has certainly returned with anger upon him from Allah. So in the Quran, in chapter number 8, Surah Al-Anfal, Allah tells us, do not turn away and run away from an army unless you're swerving. You're, it's a strategy. 
So we're head on. They're coming. We move sideways. We're not turning away, but we're taking a different position. Or, holy whatever. There are so many of them. Then we have to join another army or battalion or a, a, a company in order to become stronger. Because if we meet, meet them, we'll die. Here, the hadith, which I consider to be not authentic, says you must not do this even if your fellow fighters run away. Allah says at the end of Surah Al-Anfal, now Allah has lightened the hardship for you. And he knows that among you is weakness. So, if there are from you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. The previous ayah in the beginning of Islam, if the ratio of Muslims to the enemy is 1, 2, how much? 10. If the ratio is 1 to 10, if there is 1,000 of you, you must fight 10,000 men. If there is 100, you must fight 1,000 or less. You cannot run away. But then Allah made it lighter. So instead of 1 to 10, he made it 1 to 2. two. Allah says, Azza wa Jal, so if there are from you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. And if there are among you 1,000, they will overcome 2,000. Which means that in a fight, if the army is double the Muslim army, we must stick to our grounds and fight them to the death. If there are more, Allah tells you, don't kill yourself. Preserve yourself. Protect your Islam. Because this is better than being annihilated. And this concept of ratio and the general good is not found with a lot of the minorities of Muslims or Muslim countries. So, for example, if I'm in an occupied territory and the majority of the non-Muslims around me have the military, the police, the riot police, the arms, the weapons, everything. And the Muslims are helpless. No arms, no artillery, nothing. And they rebel, revolt. What will happen to them? We are doing jihad. The enemies would annihilate them in no time. So no problem. No, there is a problem. Islam tells you don't fight. Preserve yourself. Spread Islam. Spread Tawheed. Try to elevate the Muslims instead of killing them. What is the use of so-called jihad if you end up by the majority of the Muslims being either killed or extradited or emigrating or living in poverty? What's the use of it? Is this what Islam calls for? Bloodshed, destruction? Look at Syria. Six, seven years ago, they used to travel without any problem. They used to go to universities, to schools. They had three meals on the table. They are, until today, the most hospitable people on earth. When you go to their country, they're so hospitable. They open their homes. They host you. They give you food. What is happening to them now? They're all, all over the world. Because of what? Because of a handful of ignorant people seeing what happened in Yemen, Libya, Egypt, um, what else? Tunisia. The rebellions and said, oh, okay, we can do the same. Yalla, bismillah. Ya akhi, wait, you don't have anything. So no, 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 we'll just peacefully demonstrate what is happening now. The, those in Syria are cursing Islam. Because they think that Islam brought this to them. Islam did not bring this to them. Ignorance did. We have to fight. We have to do jihad. He's kafir. What are you doing to the people? The millions of peaceful people who just want to pray, fast, eat, and take their children to school. They destroyed their lives altogether. So this concept is extremely important to believe and to understand and Allah knows uh, best. Thirdly, I don't know who counts, who's counting? 
uh, spend on your family out of your means. This is not our topic. Do not raise a stick against your family. The Prophet is telling us not to beat our family, our children, our wives. There are people who use domestic violence. They have this. You don't have this in Mal Malaysia, do you? The sister saying, yes, the brother, no. Do you have domestic violence here? These are not men. Those who hit their wives like this are not men. There is a difference between male and man. Though the category is male, but not every male is a man. A gorilla is male, but he's not man. And this is why we do not give justice to an eagle when we say that he's a bird and so is a chicken. So this is a very important per, uh, uh, aspect. The Prophet never ever beaten a woman or a child in his life. Those who hit their wives are not men. If you're man enough, come and talk to her brother. Especially if he's my size. Speak to her father and try to beat him. If you're man enough. But beating this poor captive woman who's afraid of you because you're impulsive because you're not a man if she defends herself you may say the word that destroys her marriage in kitaliq you're divorced allah gave you this word because you're supposed to be a man if you abuse it and not use it properly then unfortunately you have a big problem so do not beat them with a stick Yet there is a hadith that says, keep it visible. What does it mean, keep it visible? That don't go to the extreme of being too soft. There has to be reward and punishment. So there has to be hung in the home a stick. So that the children would, I have sticks in my home. Never used it. But whenever I get angry with my grandchildren or my, with, with, yeah, lots of, mashallah, grandchildren said, I will lie, I will bring that stick and hit you on your feet. Khalas, this is enough. They know, they see it. But if it's not there, one of them would say, <laughs> where is it? We don't have one. But I have two or three hidden here and there and it's visible. They can see it. So this is what is meant, do not raise a stick against your family. Command your family to fear Allah the mighty and exalted. So uh, we, with this, we come to the end of this hadith, insha'Allah. We move on to hadith number 18. Is it? What is this? We finish this. 21. The thermostat in this room is a little bit crazy. Sometimes it's too cold, and sometimes it's too hot, ya Abu Ahmed. Now it's too hot. Okay. Hadith number 21 also deals with being dutiful to your parents. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, may he be disgraced, may he be disgraced, may he be disgraced. So the companion said, who are you referring to, O Prophet of Allah? This, the origin of this hadith, the Prophet had what is known as mimbar. What is the mimbar? It's the place where the Prophet climbs to give the khutbah. So it had three steps. One, two, three. So he climbed the first one and he said, Ameen. The second one, he said, Ameen. The third one, he said, Ameen. So the companions asked him, why are you saying Ameen? He said, Jibreel came to me and he said to me, one, two, three, one of them, he said, whoever attains his parents or one of them, when they are old and he does not enter paradise through them, may Allah Azza wa disgrace him. Say, Amin. So Prophet said, Amin. So if Jibreel makes supplication to Allah and the Prophet says, Amin, is there a chance that Allah will not respond to it? It's impossible. 
So whoever has his parents or one of them alive when they're old and is not admitted to Jannah, he is definitely disgraced. So you have to recalculate your calculations. What am I doing with my parents? How am I treating them? How am I dealing with them? Now, it is sufficient to enter hell to be disgraced. But to know that this could have been prevented by being kind, by being tolerant. So many times, if someone says bad things to you, it shows on your face. Yani, it shows that you are agitated. This must not be at all with your parents. So many times they criticize us, don't they? They criticize the way we look. They criticize the way we eat. They criticize our decisions in life. Sometimes they remind us of, I told you not to do this, right? You still didn't say, I told you don't marry that woman. She's evil. She's bad. Now after divorce, look what happened to you. you Subhanallah, this angers you. Does it show on your face? If it does, then you will be disgraced. Because you're hurting her feelings. You're hurting his feelings when he's old. So many, there was a clip, I think you've seen it all. An old man sitting with his young boy in the garden and he's commenting on something, repeating it. The father has Alzheimer maybe. And the son says, yes, father. Yes, father. And the fifth time he says, Halas, you've said this so many times. How many times should I say yes, yes, yes? I've heard you. And the father is, you know, like in his 80s, doesn't comment. Then the second day he brings his memoir, the father. And in the memoir, it is 40 years or 35 years ago when he's writing, my son is talking about a small bird and he repeats the same word 15 times and I correct it to him and I said yes, yes, yes without saying any complaints. The moral is, look at how the father treated his son when he was young, he was patient with him, and look how you are treating your father or you're treating your mother. They have invested so much in you, and if you fail to pay back, then their investment was not in its place. Okay. okay, hadith number 32. How much time do you have? Three minutes? 30 minutes. MashaAllah. I hope lunch is good. Okay, 32. Now, one of the things that should act as an incentive to you when you are being dutiful and respectful to your parents is that if you don't, you are in great danger. Not only because hell is awaiting you, but also because their dua. And the chapter number 17, the supplication of parents. Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet wasallam said, three supplications are answered without a doubt. One, the supplication of someone who is oppressed. Then, the supplication of a traveler. Thirdly, the supplication of parents against their children. Now, this is serious stuff. Here, he did not say supplication of parents for. He said supplication of parents against. Because the normal trend is that parents make supplication for 
their children. I personally, every single salat, every single opportunity, the priority list is for my children. That Allah guides them, that Allah returns them back to the proper Islam and to be committed to it. And to give them good health and good spouses. That's it. So it's a priority. But when a father or a mother goes to the extreme of supplicating against, then definitely this has reached a rock bottom. There can't be anything underneath. No parent in his regular mind would supplicate. Now the Prophet is telling us that this supplication is what? Is definitely to be answered. We have ample evidences from the Sunnah and for, from daily lives. From the Sunnah, the story of Juraij. You know Juraij? Those who know him, raise your hands. MashaAllah. Juraij was a man who was worshipping Allah in his ministry. He, he was a monk, so he had a special place uphill. No one can reach. It's a room, and he worships Allah there 24-7. Nothing, no movies, no music, no partying, nothing. Every day, his mother comes, and from below, she chit-chats with him for half an hour, an hour, and she leaves. She loves her son. One day, and the hadith is in Sahih Muslim, one day, she went there and said, Juraj, and he was praying. So he was confused. Hmm, should I continue my prayer or interrupt it and answer my mom? It was voluntary prayer. It's not fard. So he thought, I will continue. The second day, same thing happened. The third day, the same thing happened. And his mother got upset and said, May Allah not take your soul until you look into the faces of prostitutes. Youngsters are saying, wow, it's good. Huh? Now we have fun. No, it's not. This is for someone who fears Allah. It's a serious thing. The Prophet tells us, alayhi salam, see, see, this is something that came out. Unintentional, maybe. But it came out. The result was, the people in the community was discussing how righteous and pious Juraj is. And they were envious. How is he righteous and we are sinful? They wanted to destroy his reputation. So a prostitute came. A woman said, I can tempt him and seduce him. So they started putting bets. No, no, you cannot. This guy is too uh, righteous. He will not look into you. She said, no, no, I can. So she went and called him and tried to soften her voice. To rage. And the guy said, what the hell? He continued praying. She softened her voice, you know, wore her high heel and click, clack, click, nothing. Put her perfume, uh, 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 Gucci or whatever, Yenarichi, nothing worked. So there was money on st in stake. There's uh, betting. So she went and saw a shepherd, a man. So she said hi, and the guy, Whoa. the guy was crazy. You know? And he, they fornicated, and she became pregnant. And whenever someone asked her, who's the child for when she gave birth? She said, Juraj is the father, so that she can make some money. The people, when they heard this, got outraged. So they came to his chamber and started breaking it. And he, was, he looked, what are you guys doing? He said, come down. So he came down, and they put him in chains. And they took him to the ruler. Dragging him. He doesn't know what's happening. And I, I don't know what is causing all of this. On their way, they passed by a, 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 a whorehouse. A brothel. And, you know, they were displaying their merchandise outside. So he looked at the prostitutes. Don't, don't, I'm not going to do this. He looked at the prostitutes. Somebody might be offended. Huh? He looked at the prostitutes. And he smiled. And the people dragging 
Ah, oh, this evil person, he's smiling at the faces of the prostitutes. It's even worse. So they took him to the ruler, and the ruler asked him, uh, 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 why did you do this? He said, did what? He said, why did you have this son out of wedlock? He said, he's not my son. But let me pray two rak'ahs, please. So they allow him to pray two rak'ahs. He went to the infant who is only hours old. And he poked him in his chest. And he said, who's your father? And Allah, as a miracle, made the infant speak. My father is the shepherd. Everybody said, Allahu Akbar. He didn't say this, but I mean, this is theatrical point of view. I'm adding it this up. <laughs> they will not clap, of course. And so they said, Allahu Akbar. And they realized his innocence. They asked him, when we were passing by the brothel, why did you smile? He said, I remembered my mother's supplication. May Allah not take your soul until you look at the faces of prostitutes as a punishment. And it was fulfilled. A story from contemporary times. This happened to one of the Saudi da'is. This name is Muhammad Ba Ni'mah. He has a very strange story. And he always tells it, so this is not backbiting. When he was in high school, he used to smoke. And his father would sense the smell of smoke. And he said, do not smoke. If you smoke, I will be angry with you. I am not happy with you. I will not be pleased with you. One day he said, my father came out and he saw me with a cigarette in my hand. My father, out of frustration, said, may Allah break your neck. He said, the following day, we were, I went to school, and in the middle of the school day, we ran from the wall with a few friends and went to a guest house, which had a swimming pool. So we skipped the school day. And we went swimming with the boys. One, he said, when I wanted to come and swim, I jumped into pool. Not measuring the level of the water, I hit my ground, my head in the ground, and broke my spine. And now the gentleman is paralyzed neck downwards. He goes to masjid, from masjid to masjid, from country to country, giving da'wah on a stretcher. He cannot even move his neck. He's just like this. You can see him on YouTube. Some of you may, might have seen him in Arabic only. His name is Bani'ma, Muhammad Bani'ma, or Abdullah, I'm not sure. So the man is saying that, look what this statement of my father was made a reality in less than 24 hours. Allah broke my neck. Therefore, if you have children, beware of supplicating anything bad because Allah will respond. You never know when the heaven's gates are open and Allah Azza wa Jal answers your dua. Always be positive. Why? When you make dua, you say, may Allah break your leg. May Allah do this for you. For your children. Why not say, may Allah guide you? Even in frustration, this doesn't fulfill your yani, soul. But it's good. It's positive. May Allah Azza wa Jal guide you. May Allah make you an imam. May Allah correct you. May Allah fix you. May Allah put you in paradise. It's not like, may Allah break your leg. Doesn't fulfill your soul. But it is better because if Allah where to accept the dua, then it would be in the positive, insha'Allah, Azza wa Jal. Hadith number 44. MashaAllah, this is from the print house. It's just brand new. And the chapter is, a man should not call his father by his name, nor sit before him, uh, nor walk ahead of him. This is not a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. This is a hadith from the Tabi'i, uh, from the Sahabi. A point of information. The hadith that is related to the Prophet ﷺ 
has a terminology in the science of hadith called marfu'. So any hadith, you read this word marfu' or rafa'ahu, uplifted it, or rising high, this means that it is related to the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet is the one who said it. But when you, you hear or see the word mawquf, mawquf classifies it as the hadith of the companion, not of the Prophet ﷺ. So which hadith is this? Marfu' or mawquf? This is mawquf. So what is it? Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, saw two men walking together. So he said to the younger one, who is this to you? Who is he? So the man says, this is my father. So Abu Huraira gave him three etiquettes that must be followed with the father. One, he said, do not call him by his name. Two, do not walk in front of him. Three, do not sit ahead of him or before he does. Now, again, this is the Arab's culture. Sometimes my father's name is Luqman. So sometimes if I were to, my father died 40 years ago. So I vividly remember him. I was like maybe minus 20 years of age. So I don't know. Um, so if in Arabia, sometimes a son may joke and feel close to his father to the extent that he calls him by name. Hey, Luqman, where, 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 where you wanna have dinner tonight? So this, and the father might be good with it. The father might enjoy it. This is disrespectful. It is always respectful to show your father the respect needed, especially in front of people. This real is realized when you call him in front of others, oh, dear father. This is how the companions used to call their parents. Secondly, do not walk in front of him. Out of humility, you always walk behind your father. He leads the way. If you need to open the door for him, open it and he goes in. But you do not walk in front of him and he follows you like he's your servant. It's the other way around. So a proper child does not walk next to his father, always behind him. One or two steps, just in case he wants to say th something, you can. Don't walk like a mile away. No, close to him but behind him. And the third etiquette is that when we visit someone, it's not the first person to hit the couches. The sons usually, when they're young, the first thing they do, they sit. And their father may not find a seat and say, ah, you don't have a seat. No, this is not the appropriate way. The appropriate way is for you to be respectful, wait until he sits. Then you go and attend him. Would you like something to drink? Should I bring you something? This is the way that a real Muslim is to his father and to his mother. Like a servant. Whatever I can do to serve you, to be close to you. In Arabia, it's part of our etiquette, which is not dealing with Islam. But it's etiquette that the son is always standing when the father is sitting with his guests. He's standing. Whenever his coffee is hot, Huh? Like like now, especially when you speak, you need coffee all the time. No problem, no problem. I'm, I'm not complaining, am I? No. <laughs> so whenever the guest's cup is empty, they go and fill it and stand. Until the guests themselves feel sorry. Come on, he sit. So no, no, this is my duty. This is what makes a father proud. When his sons are men taking responsibility, doing whatever in their possession to give him pride. Unlike the poor father who's every couple of weeks is being called from the police station, your son was in a fight, your son did this, and people are complaining of him cheating or uh, 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 misdealing with their daughters. And this is a disgrace. 
So Abu Huraira is telling us how to show our respect. Daughters should do the same with their mothers. When their mothers have guests in the house. My daughters are not all alike. Some of my daughters are the guests. Seriously, so they sit and eat the, the croissants and the sweets and the chit chat. One or two of my daughters are like bees. Going to the kitchen, bringing this and cleaning the tables. Yes, what can I bring for you? Any more juice? And they keep on going around. You can see and tell that the mother is proud of this one and not as proud of it. This is what bring, brings pride to a parent's uh, a heart. Okay. We move on to Hadith 49. And how much time I have? 20 minutes. Okay, this is a different chapter now, which deals with uh, kinship. So, after going through the duties of the parents, we move on to the duties of kinship. What do we mean by kinship? In Arabic, it's called ar-rahim. And the word ar-rahim, okay, let me give you a um, commercial break. I need to drink water. This is open. Is it, you opened it, because sometimes they put something in it and out of security. <laughs> so if I misbehave, you know, it's... <clears throat> Not me. Now, when we come to the word ar-rahim in Arabic, ar-rahim refers to the womb of the mother. It's Arabic called ar-rahim. So it is derived also from Allah's mercy. Ar-rahim, ar-rahman. So it's all related to mercy, to the womb, and this kinship is a result of only your relationship to your father and mother. So the kinship you are ordered to connect to and prohibited to sever is your relationship through your father and mother, which includes your grandparents. Your siblings, brothers and sisters, your nephews and nieces, your uncles and aunts, your cousins from both sides, mothers and fathers. All of these are called what? Kinship. And it is one of the mandatory things for Muslims to connect and to uh, try to reconcile if severed. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, may Allah be pleased with him, said that a man, a, Bidu, a Bedouin, came to the Prophet ﷺ while he was traveling. The Arabic word is arada, meaning that he interrupted and came in the way of the Prophet ﷺ. And said to the Prophet ﷺ, tell me of something that would bring me nearer to paradise and further away from hellfire. And the companions used to love when a Bedouin comes and asks the Prophet ﷺ. Why? The companions had so great respect to the Prophet ﷺ that they were hesitant. Not everyone would come and ask. The Prophet had this posture, this status, that if I want to go and ask, I would think twice. Mm, no, I'm, he's so great. He's so yani, a, a Prophet. I cannot ask him. Not me. I'm sinful. 
So whenever a Bedouin comes, Bedouins don't have knowledge. They don't have etiquette. They live with camels and in the desert. What do you expect from them? Like me. I don't live in the desert, but I have the same mentality. So they love it because they come and ask direct questions. Hadith Anas, may Allah be pleased with him. He says, we used to love it when Bedouins come and ask the Prophet. A Bedouin came to the Prophet and said, O oh Prophet of Allah, a man loves people, but he cannot do what they do. So he's referring to himself and the Prophet. He says, I love the Prophet, but I cannot do your forms of worship and prayer. And you're so close to Allah. So the Prophet said, an individual, a man, a person is with whom he loves on the day of judgment. And it says, we, the companions, were never happier than after hearing this hadith. Because we are all not as great as the Prophet ﷺ, but knowing that because of our love to him, that we will be with him, this is the greatest hadith on earth. And it says, and by Allah, I love the Prophet ﷺ. And I love Abu Bakr. And I love Umar. And I pray to Allah Azza wa that I will be with them on the Day of Judgment. So they loved it when a Bedouin came and asked a question. So the Bedouin, straightforward. No spices and sugar and, and salt and pepper. Straightforward. I want something to get me closer to Jannah, further away from hell. Don't give me a lecture. Just give me a few points. The Prophet told him it's very easy. Uh, what is this? Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, worship Allah and do not associate anything with Him. Our greatest asset in this life is our Tawheed. We have nothing to show on the Day of Judgment, we don't have jihad. We don't give our money for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. We don't do a lot of night prayer. We don't fast Mondays, Thursdays, and the white days. We don't uh, offer our assistance and help to any Muslim. We see we are concealing so much to ourselves. The only thing that we can come and be proud of is our Tawheed. And this is in great danger if we do not preserve it. So the Prophet told him, easy. First of all, worship Allah and do not associate anything with Him. And perform the prayer. So prayer is essential. There is no escape. You must perform your prayer on time. Pay zakat. If the Muslims paid their 2.5 zakat over their wealth, there would not be a Muslim who is poor. But why? Muslims are manipulating their assets. 11 months and 28 days after they possess the money, they take the money and buy property. Two days before zakat is due. And two days before the second year zakat is due, they sell it and cash it into money. And then they buy stocks. And then they are evading paying zakat. And this is why we have poverty all over. And finally, among the things that the Prophet has associated with Tawheed, with Salat, with Zakat, is maintaining the ties of kinship. Now, it is extremely important to know what are the limits of Maintaining the ties of kinship. And why do we say this? A lot of the people have confusion. How do we connect the ties of kinship? And so many of them complain that they have problems. What is this? I mixed apples with oranges. End up having smoothie. No problem. Connecting to your kinship is mentioned in the Quran 
and severing your kinship is associated with corruption in the land. For you to learn today is to take your mobile phone and see your uncles and aunts, your siblings, your cousins, your nephews and nieces, and see when was the last time you contacted them. Wallah, I know of siblings living in the same city, not meeting one another. And telling their children, if you go and give salam to your uncle, I will kick you out of the home. Why is that? Because 40 years ago, they had a dispute over a silly thing. He invited his friends and left his brother and not invite him for dinner. His brother got angry. It escalated to what we see today. This is an extremely important issue that we should not take lightly because the Prophet ﷺ associated it with the most highest three good deeds, which is Tawheed, Salat, and Zakat. Moving on to Hadith number 50, in the same uh, uh, chapter, Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Okay. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, said that Allah Azza wa Jal, when He created the creation, kinship stood up. So Allah Azza wa Jal said to it, what is it? The Arabic word is mah. Mah, what's this? I think in the book it says, stop. Mah is a question mark. What is this? So the Prophet is telling us about something that took place before we were created. In the unseen. When Allah created the creation, the kinship stood. One would say, is kinship a human being? Is it a creature of Allah? All these immaterial things that we know of are at the side of Allah creatures. So is death a creature? Yes. Life is a creature. How do we know this? Allah says in ayah number two, Surah Tabarak, Al-Mulk. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Then death and life are of Allah's creations. So likewise is kinship. Kinship stood up and as the Prophet said, uh, 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 arose. What is this? Uh, so Allah said, what is it? So kinship said, this is the stance for one seeking refuge with you from being cut off. So kinship felt and sensed that the, what Allah had created would sever the kinship. So she's seeking refuge. Oh Allah, do something so that people would not sever me. So Allah Azza wa Jal says, are you content or are you not content that I should maintain connections with the one who maintains connections with you and that I should cut off the one who severs you? Kinship said, yes, indeed, my Lord. Allah says, you have this. This is granted, which means if you succeed in connecting your kinship, Allah Azza wa Jal would connect you. What, what does it mean that Allah would connect me? That Allah would have mercy on you. That Allah would provide for you. That Allah would take care of you. That Allah would give you protection. All what you need from Allah Azza wa Jal by connecting to you, if as a result, you connect the kinship. Abu Huraira explains, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, if you wish, you can recite, why is the cursor following me? Is this cursor related to this? I think someone's playing with me there. Type. Look, mashallah. That's nice. If you wish, you can recite Allah's 
ayah. So, would you perhaps, if you turn the way, cause corruption on earth and sever the ties of, of, of your relationships and your kinship? Which means that they are related. Kinship, Allah associated it with spreading corruption on this earth or in this uh, uh, land. We have time for uh, one more question. One, five minutes? Yeah, one more. Insha'Allah. Type hadith number 52 in the excellence of maintaining family ties. Now this hadith is a little bit scary. But it's beautiful. So many times I think we have another hadith that is referring to this. Uh, let me check. Yeah. Hadith 68 is related to this, but I will mention it here. And then when we come to hadith 68, we will go. So in the remaining four minutes, can you please raise both hands? Those who are asleep, yes. <laughs> both hands, both hands. Stretch, stretch. Yes, mashallah. Now I got a cramp. <laughs> okay. You will have, inshallah, a whole hour and a half to stretch and eat and sleep and let your hair down. Even you sisters, no problem. On your own, inshallah. Tayyip. A man comes to the Prophet, And this is exactly what is happening to all of us. We have similar relatives of ours like this. So he says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I have relatives with whom I maintain connections while they cut me off. I continue to call them, to visit them. They close the door in my face. They completely cut me off. I am good to them while they are bad to me. They transgress upon me while I am forbearing towards them. So give me some logic. Why would I continue to do such a thing? The worst thing on earth is when you're kind to someone and he's evil to you. How long can you go? Usually not long. So a sister goes to talk to her husband nicely. He's abusive. He never compliments her. He never says a good word to her. After a week or two, khala, she gives up. Who cares about him? Likewise, if you have relatives and you go out of your way to call them, to uh, invite them to your uh, uh, occasions, to try to be nice, but they're bad. They're abusive and you're kind to them and you tolerate them. And you try to give them gifts. Instead, they are, is this lunchtime? <laughs> Instead, they are not reciprocating. So the Prophet wasallam said these beautiful words. If things are as you have said, it is as if you are putting hot ashes on them. The more you do this, the more you are scoring a point. And as if you are putting hot ashes, not actually burning them, but it's hot and it's ash. And you are sort of insulting them, or as they say, killing them softly. I don't know why they're laughing. Uh, okay. And you will always have a supporter against them from Allah. A supporter? Who would that be? An angel. Allah appoints an angel next to you. Whenever you do this, you don't see the angel. But this supporter, Allah would have him against them from Allah as long as you continue to do that. What does this supporter do? This supporter, whenever they say something against you, he says, no, it's against you. If they curse you, he curses them back. He protects you. As long as you maintain your relationship, the, the angel, the supporter keeps on, oh Allah, forgive him. 
Oh Allah, grant him wealth. Oh Allah, make him successful. Oh Allah, protect him. Do you see him? Do you see the supporter? But you believe. Because our Prophet told us Asam, that he, this is happening. So whenever you're hesitant, don't care about what shaitan says because this supporter is with you. I have a number of relatives that I try my level best to call every other week. Those who I can visit, I visit. Mainly I just take the mobile phone. Assalamu alaikum, cuz. How are you? What are you doing? And he says, oh, you always call me. I never call you. And they're apologetic and it feels good. Why does it feel good? Because I'm worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal and I'm doing it for the sake of Allah and for something else. I will tell you after why. That's why how I became a multimillionaire. Um, so I do this. One of my relatives, a cousin, I keep on calling him every other week or sometimes every week. After a while, he said, Asim, don't call me after today. I said, why? He said, if you call me, and this is literally what he said, and he said it in English. He's Saudi, but he said it in English. We have a problem of trying to be someone who we are not. See, the Muslims think by knowing English that they are better people. They're sophisticated. I'm, you know, I speak English, no? I can speak it in different uh, accents also. So he said, Asim, if you call me to score a point with your God, don't call me. Wallahi al -Azim. This is exact words. He's a Muslim. He's a Saudi. What is this? Uh, by Saudi, not meaning nationality. All Saudis are Muslim by default. We don't have uh, uh, Saudis who are Christians. So when I say he's a Saudi, meaning that he's born Muslim. Don't get me wrong. It's not something racist. So he's Muslim. He says, if you want to score a point with your God, don't call me. If you want to call me because I'm your cousin, go ahead. I, of course, I could not tolerate myself. I cursed him a little bit. <laughs> not in the Islamic way, in your way. I said, <laughs> I, I, so many beeps and bloopers. And so, so I said, whatever, who you think you are? To prevent Allah's rewards coming to me. If Allah did not order me to call you, I would not even care about you. So the hell with you and what, what you think. And this is <laughs> mine. And, and since then, he's straightened out. I, my relationship to my cousins, to my uncles, to my siblings, to, is governed by Islam. If Islam did not tell me to connect with them, I would not even look at them. Seriously. So Islam is what drives me to be kind to them, to tolerate their ignorance, to invite them and to answer their invitations. Otherwise, I'm a person that is unsocial. I don't like to go to gatherings. I would not, Allah, even look at them. But I have to. Because Allah tells me to do. Now, the extra bonus is this angel who comes and defends you, who makes dua. The relationship between us and angels began before the creation of Adam. When Allah told them, I'm going to leave a successor on earth, they said, would you leave in it someone who would shed blood and do this corruption and so on? Allah said, I know you do not know. Even before you were born, when an, in, when an embryo is four months old, the fetus, angel comes and says, Oh Allah, what's his name? How old he will live? How, how long he will live? What is his provisions? Is he in Jannah or in hell? And he writes all of this down. When you're born, he's there to protect you. One on your right, writing the good deeds. One on your left, writing the bad deeds. They protect you when you go to pray. They protect you when you are in your home. They pray to you. They ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make you among the people of Jannah. When you pray at night, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, 
When you want to pray at night, use the miswak. Why? The Prophet said, use it because when you start to pray night prayer an hour or two before Fajr, nobody's around you. You don't call people, hi, selfie, I'm praying. <laughs> no, you're doing it for the sake of Allah. Nobody knows. Sometimes not even your wife. You start to pray and you recite Quran. The Prophet tells us the angel comes and puts his mouth in over your mouth. So whatever Quran comes from your mouth enters to him. An angel does this. Do you see the angel? No. Do you feel the presence of the angel? If you believe in the hadith, yes, I do. How will your prayer be? Five seconds? Zero to 100? It would be with concentration, contemplation. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. It comes from the heart. Because you know, this supporter is with you. He's a different one. But the angel is there. So whatever comes from your mouth goes into his. This relationship brings us to the actual reality of being bashful, of being shy, because they're all around us. Even if we are in our rooms locking the door, they are around us. So let's work hard on getting the support of this angel. May Allah Azza make life easy for all of us and make us among those who connect to the next of kin. I think we have a long break. Allahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa barakatuh.